In his review of the book for the Washington Post, Richard Kreitner wrote, Flee North, a gripping story told at a brisk pace in the no-fuss prose of a practice reporter, is a model of the advantages that journalists can bring to the writing of history. It is the kind of story we sorely need at a time when there is no shortage of opportunities for inspiring acts of heroism. Award-winning historian Henry Louis Gates commented that the book restores to American history one of the most daring African-American abolitionists, author of a long neglected slave narrative, who not only courageously fought slavery, but brilliantly satirized it. And in Publisher Weekly's starred review, they wrote, this astonishing and propulsive narrative writes this historical wrong by returning Smallwood to prominence. It's an absolute must read. It is my great pleasure to welcome Scott Sheen and Michael Fledger to the Pratt Library. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, everyone. And I have to say it's a privilege to be here with my old friend and colleague. And when I say old, I mean <laughs> long, you know, of long standing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean the other thing. Um, I was going to ask Scott you Scott Shane, you know, Scott and I worked together at the Baltimore Sun. And, you know, back then, like everyone else in the newsroom, I had the utmost respect for Scott's work. He had such a range as a reporter. He could find compelling stories in research laboratories, on street corners even at the NSA, you know, <laughs> this guy knew how to do his job and it was always, um, it was just always someone who, you know, who I respected and I think everyone in the room looked up to. He's done it again, another compelling piece. This book is, is so, so interesting. It's a fascinating read that for me kind of reordered how I thought about, how I think about the Underground Railroad. It sort of added a lot of context, a lot of uh, heft to the story I knew. I mean, the story I had learned in school was about Harriet Tubman and the Quakers, and, and that was basically what I knew. And, and, and this book certainly expands that tale. So, you know, congratulations, Scott. I think you've Thank done you, a service here. Let's start here. In the, in the subtitle of the book, you call Thomas Smallwood a forgotten hero. Why forgotten? Well, you know, I think when I kind of came across him and dug into his life and found out more and more about him, uh, not only the escapes he'd organized, uh, but also the fact that he'd written about those escapes, uh, you know, my question was, why do we not know about this guy? And uh, there is an answer to that. He, you know, he ends up in Canada running for his own life. He was operating a clandestine network. He wrote about the escapes, but he wrote about them under a pseudonym. <clears throat> but I think there's another element, which is that his white colleagues, for the most part, just left him out of the story. So uh, I, I was warned against not gesturing with the microphone. <laughs> uh, so I'll try to hold it still. Uh, but I think, you know, I think it was there's also an element of uh, even his closest partner in this operation, Charles Torrey, just sort of failing to credit him with what he did. Uh, so, you know, I think in, you know, if justice is done, this guy will be very well known. His story will be taught in schools. And, and uh, if we could only find a picture of him, we could, we could build a statue, you know? <laughs> That's amazing. You, you mentioned he's so, you know, Smallwood's a shoemaker living as a free black man in Washington, D.C., like, with slavery operating all around him. How did he manage to organize his escapes? Kind of how did his operation work? Well, so he had been born in slavery himself in Bladensburg, right outside DC, and then bought his freedom over time, uh, over a, a period of time for $500, paid it off. When he was about the age of 30, he's free. He starts this sh shoemaking business, he marries, has a bunch of kids. He's got four kids at the time, and another one's on the way. And uh, so, you know, he has sort of vowed a war on slavery, but he doesn't really know how to carry it out. And he's a busy guy. And <clears throat> it's really when this guy, Charles Torrey, comes to town and the two of them meet that they find that they're thinking along the same lines. They're tired of talking about how terrible slavery is, and they want to do something about it in a, in a concrete sense. 
And uh, so they start organizing these escapes. And, you know, the, there are several things that set, set their escapes apart, especially the beginning. They were not just waiting for people to decide they wanted to, to run. They would actually approach enslaved people that Smallwood knew and say, you know, what are you doing on Saturday night? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which was which was actually a, a popular time uh, uh, for successful escapes because there was a little more freedom on Sunday morning and they, they weren't looking for you on Sunday morning. So and uh, so they're actually recruiting people to run. And the other thing was they weren't, for the most part, sending people off in ones and twos. They were trying to do it by the wagon load. And so, you know, repeatedly you read about a wagon load of 10, a wagon load of 12, a wagon load of 15, 18. Um, and this would be men, women, and children in, you know, covered with something, uh, taking off in the middle of the, middle of the night. This is such an interesting odd couple, I think, Tory and Smallwood. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only did they free hundreds of people, but then they turned around and rubbed it in the faces of the enslavers. I mean, mm -hmm. Describe that. They, um, Smallwood would write these columns mocking enslavers, saying, hey, we did it again. We pulled this <laughs> off. Uh, yeah. And, you know, when I remember when I read the book, you know, early on, I said, to you, where did he get the courage, you know, to do that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And where did he get the motivation in yeah. a way? I mean, yeah. that's the, one of the things I just think of in a practical sense is he's running this shoemaking business by day. He's helping organize these escapes by night. When does he find time to, to, you know, settle down, light a candle or whatever, and, uh, you know, write up these dispatches that he then mails off to Albany? Um, but somehow he did it. Um, you mentioned the odd couple. So Charles Torrey is about a dozen years younger. He, um, he was not from a wealthy family uh, outside Boston, but he was from a well-connected family. His parents died of tuberculosis, and he... Uh, was raised by a grandfather who had actually served in Congress. He went to Exeter. He went to Yale. So he had sort of an elite education. Um, but uh, he, so in that sense, he was sort of the opposite of Thomas Smallwood, who had um, first been taught to read by his enslaver and then uh, was a servant in a house, the household of a uh, an educator in Washington, a guy who, who ran a, a number of schools. And that guy who was from Scotland and his uh, adult children all apparently took an interest in Thomas and, you know, sort of getting him into literature and so on. So strangely enough, I think by the time they meet in the beginning of um, 1842, despite those very different backgrounds, um, I think their educations were in some ways comparable. Because uh, Smallwood had just absorbed this from all, all over the place. And later, you know, he's sort of constantly quoting philosophers and quoting poets and showing how much uh, he knew. Um, and I think the other thing they had in common over the chasm of race and age and, edu and formal education was uh, Tory had been as a New Englander who became an abolitionist. He'd been on the lecture circuit. He'd been involved in these kind of internecine fights in the, in the abolitionist community. Uh, so he'd been a lot of overheated meeting halls talking for four hours. And Smallwood had taken an interest in colonization, which was this movement for uh, African Americans to just give up on this country and move to somewhere else, Sierra Leone, Barbados, um, but, also, but in particular Liberia which was the colony in West Africa that had been founded by the American uh, Colonization Society. And there was a big debate in the black community in D.C. and Baltimore over this <clears throat> question. Basically, it came down to, is this a good thing to just leave the country that you, uh, uh, the only country you know, behind and try to get a new start somewhere else? And also, eventually, kind of what are the motives of the white people who were financing this operation. And Smallwood was very interested for a number of years. And then, you know, you get the feeling that the scales fell from his eyes and he realized that basically we're talking about ethnic cleansing and that the, uh, the white people who were funding the uh, American Colonization Society <clears throat> actually 
their problem was not with enslaved black people, it was with free black people. And they wanted to just, you know, usher them out of the country. And so he broke with that and tried to convince all his friends to break with that. But he too had been involved in a whole lot of talk, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you get the feeling they come together in 1842 and they're both ready to do something very concrete. Yeah. And that's what they do. Yeah, and, and very radical too, right? And very radical and very dangerous. Yeah. Now, yeah. how did these columns go over? <laughs> Like so well, so the um, you know the reason Tory comes to town is he has uh, he, he's a guy who briefly tried his hand as teaching, then briefly tries his hand at preaching and just flames out completely in both of those professions, and so he then becomes caught up in the anti-slavery cause, and he's going to be his new idea is to be a correspondent for a bunch of small abolitionist papers in the north. He'll come to D.C. He'll cover Congress, he'll cover the debates over slavery, and he'll send his dispatches north. Um, but you, um, <clears throat> you get the feeling that he was much more interested in what he could do sort of hands-on in anti-slavery than, than even sending these columns off. Uh, but the, um, one of the papers he is uh, connected with, or he's, he's formed a little bit of relationship with, is a little paper in Albany then called Toxin of Liberty, T-O-C-S-I-N, an old word for bell. So basically it's Liberty Bell. And it's a small um, abolitionist paper. <clears throat> and he's sending his columns off to them uh, as he gets his start. But once they get these wagon loads going off at night, um, it appears that it's Smallwood who takes the lead and, and certainly continues to send these dispatches off. Uh, and, you know, his, it's, you know, if, if I could get a half hour with Thomas Smallwood, I, I would, uh, I'd pay a lot of money for that. And one of the questions I would ask him is just like, what were you about? But, you know, you know what, why were you taking this somewhat risky step, even if you're writing it under a pseudonym, of calling attention to the escapes, you know, using the real names of the enslavers, using real names of the people who escaped, writing it in real time. Uh, and I have not found any other example of, of somebody writing about escapes in real time. And it was so much in real time that uh, Smallwood occasionally mentions that he had to hold a column and not send it off to Albany until he was sure he heard from uh, usually Canada that the people he's writing about were already safe on the other side of the border. Um, but I think part of it was his personality, his interest in literature. He was a big fan of Charles Dickens and he took his uh, pseudonym from Charles Dickens and he kind of liked that Dickensian satirical style. But I also think for him as well as for Tory, there was sort of a larger strategy that was um, th that was part of their plan. What they wanted to demoralize people? Or? Yeah, basically they wanted to not just move these people, uh, you know, in, in whatever numbers they could out of the reach of the enslavers, but their hope was that seeing, you know, there were people in D.C., people in Baltimore who had, say, owned half a dozen people, and they wake up one morning and they're gone, and that was a lot of money. Uh, you know, I, I calculated, I made a rough calculation that a wagon load of 15 people that Smallwood describes might have been worth something like two hundred thousand dollars in today's dollars, uh, and so you're talking about a big chunk of people's, even wealthy people's wealth, just disappearing overnight. So I think they were hoping to essentially undermine faith in the in the system. Uh, and Smallwood describes overhearing a couple of these enslavers because he would lurk and eavesdrop in his neighborhood and at the market and at the rail station. And he'd hear some of the people <clears throat> who he was uh, relieving, shall we say, of their human property and writing about, he'd hear them talking, uh, you, you know, and, and uh, so he heard them talking, a couple of them talking about how I'm never gonna buy another slave. Um, I'm done with this. Mm -hmm. And of course that was music to his ears because that's what he wanted. He wanted to say, you know what? It's a heck of a lot easier to just hire somebody and pay them. 
What an extraordinary thing. <laughs> uh, um, now, answer me this. Um, Tory hasn't been totally lost to history, but until now, Smallwood was. You know, people yeah. didn't know about him. Why do you think that is? Well, I think um, Tory came from a, um, a strong community of abolitionists in Massachusetts. He'd been active on the scene in, in Massachusetts abolition for a few years before coming south to DC. Uh, so he's kind of well connected up there. When he dies, he gets a monument in a, a beautiful graveyard in Cambridge. It's kind of like an obelisk. It has a has his face on it and has some quotations. And now it's surrounded by flowers. It's it's really quite lovely. Um, and he also, after he died, uh, another abolitionist kind of pulled together a memoir of Tory that's mostly drawn from his journals and his correspondence. Um, and then in more recent years, I guess 2013, um, a distant cousin of Tory wrote a you know modern, a very good modern biography of Charles Tory. So he is not a well-known figure, but he has um, he has certainly not been ignored. Whereas uh, Smallwood. I think it's fair to say has been ignored. And, you know, part of it is um, the fact that he operated under, under pseudonym and that he, he moved to Canada. But I think there's definitely more to it because, you know, in his later years, Tory uh, was writing, his letters are, are mostly preserved, uh, or many of them are pre preserved. And he was writing about the escape operations at a time when Smallwood was safely in Canada. And, um, and even when Smallwood had been named outed in the, in the Baltimore Sun, in fact. And uh, so there was no reason to withhold his name, certainly in a private letter. But he did. And he took essentially took credit for the escapes that Smallwood had organized not only with Tory, but on his own, because Tory went off to be the editor of that paper in Albany. And so for, for a year or more, Smallwood was doing this all by himself. And so, um, so I think there is definitely a racial element in this, um, an element of, of racism, um, of, of sort of not crediting Smallwood. God knows why exactly. Uh, with what he had achieved, and maybe a little bit of a desperation on Tory's part to <clears throat> to leave his mark on history and to prove to the many doubters, uh, even in his own family, that he had uh, he'd, he'd accomplished something. Yeah, I, I noticed in the review that ran in a very fine newspaper I worked for for many years. Uh, <laughs> they point out that you kind of slapped Tory around a little bit, you know, for you know for not giving credit to Smallwood. And I think the word they use, the review uses churlish. Churlish, <laughs> yes. Churlish. I don't know you to be mean, Scott. <laughs> but why did, you, why did you say that? Well, so, so um, I, first of all, I mean, I think that the, the post review was fabulous. And, um, and I don't even mind the reviewer calling me churlish. I, I like that word, churlish. I've always liked that word. Um, yeah, yeah. But, That's a great rant. But I think, I think he and I disagree. <laughs> um, but he and I actually exchanged uh, emails after the review ran, and um, and he makes a very good point, which is that Charles Tory risked everything, yeah. everything, his family, his uh, his life uh, for this cause, for the anti-slavery cause, and that's why um, this reviewer thought it was kind of um, a little nitpicking to. Um, point out that he had never credited Smallwood. But, you know, there were consequences for that. No one's heard of Smallwood. I mentioned Tory's uh, lovely uh, grave, very impressive uh, grave and, and sort of memorial in, um, in Cambridge, Mass. And uh, Tory's grave is in the Toronto necropolis and the old Toronto city graveyard. And um, <clears throat> my wife, Francie, and I, who's here, uh, spent a lot of time tromping around that graveyard looking for any trace of Smallwood's grave. And 
it, he is buried there. There's a record that shows he's buried there. But any stone has long since sunk underneath the grass, and uh, there's no sign that, you know, that he was ever there. I learned something, you know, many things reading this book. One was, you write that Smallwood was the one who coined the term Underground Railroad. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, uh, and what's the origin of that term? And how were you able as a journalist to pin that down to sort of, sort of know that that's true? So, um, it's, it's sort of a fun story concerning this is a book about slavery. Uh, and um, basically, <clears throat> it, and it has a Baltimore angle, uh, I'm pleased to say. So... There was a uh, notorious police constable by the name of John Zell. And he, like a lot of police in those days, uh, made uh, much of his money on the side um, running after people who had fled slaver slavery and dragging them back for the reward money that the enslaver was offering. And so what Smallwood heard from somebody who had overheard this guy, John Zell, exclaiming in frustration one day, you know, I don't know how these people are escaping. They're not leaving a trace. They must be getting away by underground railroad or steam balloon. And that's basically like we would say, they must have been teleported to Canada or, <clears throat> or they must have been abducted by aliens. In other words, I have no clue how they're getting out of here because there were no underground railroads. There were railroads, but not underground railroads. And steam balloon was sort of like a, an experimental technology, we could say. So, um, so apparently Smallwood got wind of this, and he, he uh, in his somewhat snarky fashion, advises a slaveholder who has lost his, uh, whose, as Smallwood once puts it, uh, in one place puts it, whose human property, whose walking property had walked off. He advises um, that person that perhaps they uh, left by the Underground Railroad or steam balloon that this consul was, was swearing about the other day. And then clearly something clicked and Smallwood thought, this is great because first of all, it was a huge compliment to him and this operation. And so he starts riffing on the notion of an Underground Railroad and he, he advises the uh, slaveholders to report to the office of the Underground Railroad in Washington for word <laughs> of their missing property. And uh, he at one point says uh, he can't reveal the secret of the Underground Railroad, which is only known to the president and the cabinet. Uh, <laughs> this guy lived a 15 minute walk from the US Capitol. So it was sort of an inside the beltway joke, uh, way ahead of, uh, of the beltway. And, um, and at one point, he, he names himself general agent of all the branches of the National Underground Railroad. So, um, but, you know, you ask, how, how can I be sure that no one else had used it before? And I can't be absolutely sure. But in terms of um, print newspapers, um, you know, I just went into these giant, wonderful newspaper databases that they have now that are growing all the time. But newspapers.com is one. Another one's called gene genealogybank.com. And they, uh, they go way back, and they go way back before the 1840s. And if you put in Underground Railroad, and also because they're, um, the way they wrote it out was somewhat um, variable at the time, so you, sometimes Underground Railroad was four words and not two, um, you put all that into these search engines, and you find that the very first references are from Smallwood's letters. And, you know, in the months after that, you begin to see some people pick it up and use it as he did as essentially a way to mock the slaveholders. And then eventually, within a couple of years, it's become um, a sort of fairly commonplace way, a handy way to refer to escapes from slavery more generally. Um, but I, I think it's... it's um, the evidence is, is very clear that he's the guy who, you know, put this phrase on the map. You, you say, you called um, the area where Smallwood operated, D.C., Baltimore area, bordering the free state of Pennsylvania, roughly, um, slavery, slavery's borderland. Yeah. Um, two things. Um, why, did, why was his work so important there, like where, you know, you're so close to freedom, yeah. so to speak, A, and B, describe kind of the daily horror of free black people living in this borderland region. 
So, yeah, what struck me um, was that uh, if, if you think about New Orleans, you're never going to meet an abolitionist, or you're almost never going to meet an abolitionist, right? Uh, if you think about Boston, you're never going to meet a slave trader. Um, in Baltimore, in Washington, all of these people are mixed up together. Um, enslaved African Americans are there in numbers. Free African Americans in those cities actually outnumber the enslaved people by a considerable margin. Um, so you have all these different types mixing it up in a way they don't anywhere else. And I think it, it's a very combustible mix. And you know, uh, and that's clear from the story I'm telling the 1840s, but just to, an aside, something that happened in Baltimore in uh, the 1820s was a, uh, a local abolitionist publisher, a guy named Benjamin Lundy, had called the leading slave trader of that era a monster in human shape, among other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the slave trader <clears throat> ran into him as Lundy was trying to go to the post office one day and basically beat the crap out of him. And, uh, and uh, Lundy sued, and it ends up in court, but the courts were very kind of pro-slavery, <clears throat> and the judge says, I've never seen a, a worse incitement for a beating and fines the slave trader one dollar. So you had these kind of very combustible um, you know, this, this kind of combustible mix all the time. And one of the other things um, that you realize as you read about folks is that while you know, manumission crossing from being enslaved to being free is obviously an enormous step for somebody living in Maryland, you're not crossing into full citizenship by any means. And you know, um, just following the, the life of Thomas Smallwood, um, who was enslaved and then was free, you realize that, um, you know, when he was free, like everyone else who was black uh, in this region, in the city of Baltimore City, Washington, there was a 10 p.m. curfew. If you're on the street for any reason after 10 p.m., you get hauled into the police station, you can be fined, you can be beaten, you can be lashed, um, and... Uh, you know, and actually the cops would sometimes um, park themselves outside churches at night, black churches, uh, because if people kind of get caught up in the spirit and they overrun the 10 p.m., they can get a whole bunch of church going people on their way out and, you know, either extort some bribes or, or make some money. So, it, you know, you couldn't travel out of state and come back in unless you did some, got a special essentially permission to do it. Uh, some government paperwork. And at any time, even if you were free, you were subject to the unscrupulous um, bounty hunters, kidnappers, who would grab free people, take them to the slave trader, and you know, and the next thing you know, you're you're shipped hundreds of miles from your wow. family. Yeah. Incredible. I was surprised to read about Hope Slatter, a <laughs> slave trader who operates in what is now like Baltimore's tourist zone. Like exactly, his, yeah. his operation was where, Howard and Pratt Streets? Yes, right on Pratt, on, right. the, on the north side of Pratt, right uh, just uh, east of Howard. Yeah. And um, so he, he was the biggest slave trader in town from about 1838 to 1848. Um, but there were a half dozen major slave traders. Most of them were located generally around the Inner Harbor, which was then known as the Basin. And Basically, what had happened was this region had a surplus of agricultural labor because tobacco wears out the soil. And so this very labor-intensive tobacco crop was being replaced by grain and other kinds of crops that needed fewer farmhands. So, um, you know, many people were actually manumitted, were freed by their enslavers in Maryland in the early years of the 19th century. But then what happened was... Uh, the cotton gin was invented, and the cotton plantations of the Deep South started to boom. And there, uh, the demand for labor down there was insatiable. So instead of uh, just freeing the people you no, no longer needed, uh, you know, you could summon, send a note down to Hope Slatter 
at his slave jail, that was the terminology, his private slave jail on Pratt Street, and he would send his boys to come collect, you know, uh, whoever it was, and give you $500, $600, and then Slatter would collect a, uh, a shipload, basically, and put them on a ship and send them down to New Orleans. How many people are we, are we talking here? Like and we're talking, shipload? you know, he, the, the ships usually had other cargo mm -hmm. as well, but uh, from the manifests, uh, this was actually, there, were, there was good record keeping by the federal government, uh, strangely enough, because uh, the African trade had been banned, which was the reason the only source of labor was, uh, you know, domestic enslaved people. And uh, so they, to kind of make sure these people were not coming from Africa, <clears throat> the, uh, the shippers were required to have a, detailed manifest with the name, age, and um, other details on all the people who are put on board. So we know that, you know, a typical load for Slatter might be 40, 50, 60, um, as many as 100 people on a, on a ship. They would usually be put down in the hold. Um, it wasn't as gruesome as the Middle Passage, um, but the, the peak of shipping people south was really the winter months. So when they were leaving here, it was cold. You know, it could be very cold, and um, and there, you know, there people in some cases were shackled, and so you could imagine, and they were shackled usually in the hold with a lot of, you know, it could be livestock, could be all kinds of things that were being sh uh, sent down there, it could be wet. Um, so a kind of nasty journey of about three weeks usually to get well, to New Orleans. So slatter my traffic. What? How many people a year? You'd say. I mean, um, hundreds, yeah. hundreds, and uh, and on in each case they would go to the New Orleans showroom. Believe it or not, that was the term. I mean, like a car they showroom. Used, like a car showroom, okay. um, where uh, his brother would operate the sort of southern end of the business, and uh, people would come from the from the um, you know the plantations and buy people. And you know, part of the tragedy of the domestic slave trade is that if you weren't separated from your family when you were sold uh, to slatter, which often you were, because uh, you know, an enslaver might say, "I'm going to sell the wife, but not the husband. I'm going to sell the mother, but you know, the kids can stay here." So they're constantly uh, families being separated there. But if you made it intact as a family to New Orleans. You know, once again, you could be right. sent off to, to plantations even in different states. So, um, you know, that's something that's hard to imagine today. But if you were shipped off hundreds and hundreds of miles away from your family, it was likely you would never see them yeah. again. Yeah. And, you know, a, a sort of poignant footnote is that for decades after the Civil War, black families were placing classified ads basically in papers saying they were sometimes called lost friends ads and it would say um do you have any idea where my mother is here's a here's her name here's a description she was uh some of them mentioned hope slatter yeah. she was um taken away by hope slatter in you know in 1847 and i've never seen her again <clears throat> That's amazing um you know although slave trading was legal right and lucrative as we know it somehow was not respectable, right? In at least in certain circles in Baltimore. And I, I this book is so serious and there's so many sad things, but I chuckled in places reading about Hope Slatter's yes. kind of quest for respectability. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he, he seems to have that. tirelessly quested not only for money, which he made an awful lot of, but for respectability and for acceptance among uh, Baltimore's slaveholding elite. Um, and what's interesting, you know, it's sort of the psychology that's interesting. It seems the slaveholders, though they were very dependent on the slave traders, uh, they used the services of the slave traders, they wanted somebody to look down on. And so you could tell yourself that you uh, were a kind master and you were treating your people well uh, and you were feeding them well. But that guy, Hope Slatter, you know, he's just all about the money. <laughs> so he um, so there's funny little things you can uh, you know in, in researching this book that I came across 
One being that they were building a big new, um, lovely, I think it was Greek Revival Methodist Church on Charles Street. Church is gone now. Um, but it was brand new. And one way they, they raised the money for a church in those days was they would sell the pews. So you would pay a, a substantial sum and that would be your pew forever, I guess. And so Slatter bought a pew in one of these churches. But, uh, you know, I found a letter to, to I guess it was a letter to, to uh, the editor of a newspaper in which the guy who bought the pew behind Slatter said he and his family were not going to go to church until, you know, if there was any chance of having to look on this despicable slave trader. <laughs> so uh, he couldn't get a break, and uh, eventually he he finds uh, respect by moving to the Deep South himself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you a little bit about kind of the journalism here. How did you get onto this story? How, when did you first learn about Smallwood and and this much about the domestic slave trade, and what was it that made you think, aha, this is a book? <laughs> well, um, actually goes back probably about 25 years. Um, we'd been living for quite a few years, this was in the 90s. We'd been living in Baltimore for quite a few years that, at that time, and I kind of thought I knew the city, I knew the history of the city a little bit, and but somewhere I came across the fact that this the slave trade had had thrived at the harbor for many, many years, uh, kind of 1810 till the Civil War. And I read a little more about the slave trade and I was just completely shocked by it. And I found that most of my colleagues at the Baltimore Sun did not know, this was news to them too. So I got some eye rolls from the editors, I remember, who did remind me this is a newspaper. <laughs> um, but uh, they let me write a long story about the slave trade in Baltimore. And I always wanted to come back to it because I found it such a, such an affecting story and one that was so little known to, I think, most Americans. So when I quit my day job at the New York Times in 2019, at the end of 2019, uh, you know, my plan was to start researching it and looking for a story in the, in, in the slave trade. Uh, of course, there was a pandemic and the archives all closed and the libraries closed. And, uh, but I also found that <clears throat> virtually everyone who was being sold south was illiterate and the slave traders were not leaving detailed journals so it was very difficult to find a story strictly in the slave trade so i started kind of looking around and i i heard about um a guy an abolitionist who had died in the maryland penitentiary and you know that i started following that thread and, and eventually i come across tory and uh, a guy who's more or less portrayed in the in the few um, books that mention him, Smallwood. But Smallwood is comes across as sort of a uh, really a black sidekick, a black right. helper of Charles Tory. And then I I kind of dig in on Smallwood, and increasingly I realize Smallwood is about a dozen years older than Tory, and um, a whole lot more. Uh, wise and reliable. So, it, it, you know, Tory has his um, strengths, one of them being just sort of a wild recklessness and boldness. But um, but it was really the other way around that, that Tory was the sidekick to Smallwood. And then when eventually I talked the Boston Library into the Boston Public Library into digging up uh, what looks like the fullest run of this obscure Albany abolitionist paper. Um, and they put it on microfilm. You know, who knew they, they were still microfilming things? But they put it all on microfilm. And I spent a long day at the Boston Public Library downloading it from microfilm uh, onto a thumb drive. Okay. And then a lot of long days reading all this fine print. And once I, you know, had read a lot of Smallwood's letters, I just said, you know, this, this guy is the core of this book. So, yeah, I noticed in the acknowledgement acknowledgments, you talk about a phone call from your brother, <laughs> yeah, who who makes a brotherly <laughs> joke, right? You know, he's like, you know, we're gonna hear from a white guy. You yeah, know, you know, I believe you know. his. <laughs> yeah, I believe give me the quote. His, uh, I think I think when uh, when I got a contract to write this book, uh, I mentioned it to him, and he said, "Oh, that's 
That's great, Scott. It's about time we heard what white people think about this. Right, and, uh, right, right. There you go. You know, from your from your very your your own brother. Yeah, right, right, heart. right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as only your brother can do. As I only mean. your brother can do. <laughs> exactly. And you know, so how I, did you uh, deal with that? And I mean, I did it, take right. that to heart yeah. um, in the sense that I, um, you know, I guess I try to approach it with a certain amount of humility and to understand that I don't have the experiences to, to fully comprehend a guy like Smallwood and what he was going through then. But, but one of the things that has always kind of bugged me is the way black history is sometimes shunted off to the side. Mm -hmm. And it's in February. And Lord knows there's a lot of good history taught in February for that very reason. But... It always has um, perplexed me and um, sort of annoyed me that slavery is often treated as black history to be dealt with in February. You know, um, Hope Slatter, you may be surprised to hear, was not black. <laughs> and uh, the people who enslaved, uh, you know, at that time, three million people were not black. This is white history, you know? This is American history. American history. And in that sense, um, I guess I have been, I've taken weird um, encouragement from the um, Ron DeSantis's of the world uh, talking about how white people are getting their feelings hurt right. and so on. Right, right. I think that, that strain in our politics, which I find kind of absurd, makes it all the more important for white people to read about this history and maybe even to write about this history. Yeah, yeah I think we've reached the point in the program where I want to hear questions from the audience. There are microphones on each side, so if you have a question, please don't be shy. You know, line up. Scott's full of answers. <laughs> and one final thing, you know, while yeah, yeah. people are thinking of questions. Um, sure. Uh, Um, you know, there may have even been some doubt about, is it really true that this guy has discovered someone who, you know, we never really knew about? So there may have been some skepticism about this guy who, about me, I had just spent 15 years writing for the New York Times about national security. Right. <laughs> you, you know, I have absolutely no credentials uh, to write this. So, uh, so that might have been, been it too. Interesting. Well, we'll go to the questions. Let's start here. Good evening, I have two questions for you. The first one is, did you get any information about Smallwood's descendants or get to meet any of them? And the second question is, what were his pseudonyms? <laughs> okay, so uh, I have done some uh, work on uh, Ancestry.com, hunting for descendants. One of the tragic facts of Thomas Smallwood's life is that he lives to a ripe old age but all his five children predecease him. And uh, most of them die uh, without children. But there were some children, and I've traced them to a certain point, but I have not found any living descendants. But frankly, I got to get back to it because I think there may well be some. My guess is, I think I've counted seven generations or something like that. So my guess is when I contact them, it's going to be a big surprise to them <laughs> that they're, that they're you know, descended from this guy. But it would be really a fun, a fun thing to do and something I'm going to keep pursuing. Uh, in terms of Smallwood's um, pseudonym, uh, as I think I mentioned, he was a big fan of Charles Dickens. Dickens at that time, I guess it was 1840, had published the Pickwick Papers. And it, was, it became a kind of global bestseller. It was a huge, hugely popular novel. And so uh, Smallwood, so there's a character in there named 
Sam Weller or Samavel Weller, which I think is Dickens' way to, of trying to capture this guy's Cockney accent. And um, so Smallwood calls himself Samavel Weller Jr., uh, Sam Weller's son, and uh, and has a, a lot of fun with that. And one of the, this is something I, I can't prove one way or the other, but in the middle of everything we're talking about, Charles Dickens makes uh, a trip to the United States, and he makes stops in Washington. He makes stops in Baltimore. He comments on slavery in Baltimore. He comments being in a Baltimore restaurant in a hotel and being served by someone, by a waiter, who he suddenly realizes is enslaved, and he talks about his feelings uh, of kind of horror uh, of being, you know, sort of served by an enslaved man. Uh, anyway, in the guise of Sam Weller, in these columns for the Albany paper, uh, Smallwood says, I met Dickens when he came to town, uh, and I, you know, led him to a slave jail that was, there was kind of an infamous uh, slave trader in Washington by the name of William Williams. And his slave jail was right off the National Mall, believe it or not. If you walk from the White House to the Capitol, you go right by. And so according to this, um, you know, true or false account, um, Sam Weller, i.e. Smallwood, helped lead Dickens to see this slave jail and uh, could this be true? It definitely could. Uh, you know, uh, Small was in town. Dickens was followed by a big crowd as he went around town because he was a very popular guy. And uh, so it's certainly possible that Smallwood was in the crowd following Dickens around. And also, Small uh, Dickens was uh, very interested in slavery, which appalled him. So if someone had said, I could, he does not describe this in his book, which is called American Notes. Uh, but if someone said, Mr. Dickens, you want to see a slave trader's premises, uh, I'm sure he would have said, let's go. <laughs> so, so it could have been true. It could have been true. Thank you very much for this uh, talk. And, and I really want to thank you also for this wonderful book that you've written. Um, I wondered, uh, I had another question about the research that you did um, to get this, this story. And I wondered if in your research you came across information that discussed other uh, members of the community in which uh, Mr. Smallwood lived. For example, were there other freed men or freed women who may also have experienced some level of um, either retribution or suspicion that they may have been involved in this. Mm. Were there was there were there articles in papers that were written that were accusing others? Um, also, you know, as a large number of people are getting on board this underground railroad, they may have left family members behind. Do we have any information mm. that says it was, a, you know, th that his heroics uh, also may have had? Um, some unintended consequences for other people mm. uh, in the area. Thank you so much. Wow, that's a that's a that's a bunch of good questions. Um, let me think. I mean, there's actually a moment where Smallwood, in one of these dispatches, mocks the police for having picked up a guy on suspicion, basically, of being Smallwood, of being the guy who's organizing these escapes, and uh, apparently that guy was set free. But Smallwood has a a grand time basically saying, you know, you dummies. He calls them poor puppies at one point. Uh, you know, he has lots of, of names for the cops. And and uh, and he says, you know, you picked up the wrong guy. You're on the wrong trail. You guys are hopeless. And um, in both Baltimore and Washington, there were large rewards offered by apparently um, a, a little syndicates of slave traders and slaveholders for the arrest of whoever was behind these escapes. Um, and the, um, the, then the, the other question had to do with um, separating families. I mean, one of the great ironies, of course, of taking advantage of a moment when it's possible to run is that you're probably leaving some or, you know, some of your family members behind. Um, rarely, 
you know, would it be possible to, for, you know, let's say six members of a family uh, enslaved in one place or two places to coordinate everything and get away without arousing suspicion all at the same time. So that people definitely did depart. And you see uh, occasionally Smallwood will address the enslaver, again, always by name. These are real people. I found them, you know, I found them in the records. And he'll address someone and say, you know, this, um, the woman who used to work for you is now living in Toronto and she misses her husband. You know, um, couldn't you see, uh, see fit to let him join his family in, in, you know, in Toronto or something like that? So uh, it was definitely a factor. The only thing you can say is that the person who was fleeing knew where the rest of the family was and they could make efforts to either raise the money to buy their freedom, to help them escape sometimes, you know, long distance. You think about Harriet Tubman going back down into Dorchester County again and again. She knew where her family members were and she kept trying to get them out and she got them out. Um, so it was not the question of being separated forever in many cases uh, as, as the slave trade resulted in. One other thing occurs to me is that after Smallwood is in Canada, living there, has just gotten there, but he's living there with his family and trying to make a new life. Uh, you know, three men come to him and say, you helped us get here. Would you help our wives and children get here? And he's like, I'm sure he was like, oh my God, you know, but he, he did it. He did it. He went to work to try and make it happen. We have time for two more questions. Hello, and I'm enjoying myself listening. I, um, my name is Kim Manuel, and I had an uncle that was born in 1871. Uh -huh. He wasn't a slave. He wasn't born as a slave because they had a, a certain amount of freedom. And um, in 1871, he did work for a penny a day where he wow. talked to us about, you know, the different things. So he said he was born f free, uh -huh. but he still had slave instincts until yes. he got to a certain age and he went into the army. But even in the army, he was saying that when they got a certain amount of quotas, you have to go and do something else different. Mm -hmm. So he made bullets and the copper mine in South Baltimore uh, for the for the army. And it's so exciting to hear even before he was born that it was a trader thing going on. Mm -hmm. And listening to you talk is so educational and it hits a lot of good things. And my uncle died in 1987. No kidding. He wow. lived till he was 116 years Long old. Long life. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, Werner, thank you for this book. I enjoyed reading about this period of time that you um, have wrote about. Um, it's my understanding that uh, around 1808, that kind of cease the middle passage. However, in the Chesapeake, which makes this book very interesting that you're writing about, um, African-Americans were bred here. Yes. And that, that's where most of, at least two almost and a half generations. So this motion that you talk about going to from Baltimore to New Orleans makes for an interesting dynamic in the sense that from there, they were kind of spread throughout America. What I do find interesting that you keep speaking in reference to kind of like whole families, when in fact, during the time of breeding, it wasn't quite that way. And the other element that I hear coming from you is the fact that there seems to be some complicity with regards to the federal government and that they know more than what they are revealing to people like myself. And it would mm -hmm. seem to me, hopefully, based on your research, that somehow we could get better records with regards to the chattel, because they did do good recordation 
on things that they perceive to be um, mercantile. Yes. Well, those those are those are all great points. I mean, the reason the Feds kept these manifests of the domestic slave trade was essentially enforcing that law that you referred to in 1808 that said you could no longer import captives, captive workers from Africa. Um, beyond that, you know, and you know, during the time we're talking about. The U.S. Census never recorded the names of enslaved people, just their uh, gender and age, generally speaking, in the U.S. Census. And it was only later on uh, that people began to be uh, recognized, really in the post-slavery period, uh, as, as full human beings. Uh, so there's a huge um, vacuum of information about those who were enslaved. And Smallwood is a bit of an example. He wrote a memoir, a short memoir in 1851, and he makes no reference whatsoever to his parents. And I couldn't identify his parents from existing records. And it made me wonder whether, as you point out, I I'm referring to whole families, but in fact, families were constantly being shattered and split. And it made me wonder whether his parents might have been separated from him at a very early age and moved somewhere else in Maryland or shipped down to New Orleans. And, um, <clears throat> but I found it, um, you know, potentially, um, well, I, I found it kind of poignant and potentially very significant that he doesn't uh, talk about his parents. Well, is that a cleave? Is that? Yes, it is. Okay, thank well, thank you, Scott, and thank all of you. I guess we've reached the <laughs> book signing day. Thank you, Michael. <laughs>